How did you know people would go for exactly the kind of entertainment that you were offering? I didn't. It just happened by accident. When I put those surfers on the stage and they dropped their pants, I didn't know that that was going to last five years. I thought, it's a, a gimmick today, it'll be over tomorrow. But the lady said, we want more, more, more. Jack Sion was well known in the Honolulu community during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Not because he owned 12 nightclubs, but because he was a showman whose talents and chutzpah seemed to have no boundaries. Jack Sion, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako. I'm Leslie Wilcox. If Jack Sion was a household name in Honolulu, it was because he made sure the press showed up every time the police arrived to take him off to jail. He was an accomplished entrepreneur and marketer, but his talents extended beyond the business realm. His real passion was in show business, where he got his start at a very young age. When you were born, you had a different name than the one you have now. Yes, <laughs> Jackie Chunne. Real Italian, C-I-O-N-I. Traditional Italian home, Catholic? Oh yes, Catholic, a little town right out of Chicago where everyone was Catholic. I remember one time I dated a Jewish girl. My family had a fit because if they were very, very <laughs> strict. You were Italian, you went to the Italian church, you only associated with Italians. And in that little community, there was the Polish church, the Irish church, the Italian church, the Lithuanian church. And you stuck to your people at own your own group, church. Right. Huh. The families in those days kept a tradition. I had an uncle that belonged to the Al Capone gang in Chicago. And um, I loved his way of life, expensive cars and fancy clothes and eating in fancy restaurants. He had the big Packard with those white wall tires on each side. What did your family think about his lifestyle? Oh, they didn't, that's when they disowned me. And um, I didn't speak to my father for years. At When I graduated high school, I, I left the Chone family. <laughs> what, how old were you when you gravitated to your uncle? 14. I was a piano player. Boogie Woogie was real popular then. And so I, he got me a job in a nightclub in Chicago. I mean, you were just a kid yes. playing in, at nightclubs. Until what, what time did you go to sleep? Well, I changed my age. I was, I was 20 then, everybody thought, because uh, I had a mustache at 14. I didn't look like a high school student. And um, I was making $75 a week. That's Just good money in 19. <laughs> and how did you keep up with school when you were actually working in the city? Yes, well, I didn't keep up with school. That was the sad part. I remember one day a teacher said to me, Jackie Tooney, you're going to be a bum. You're going to be a bum if you don't learn algebra and English. And I said, get out of my face, honey. I make 75 bucks a week. What are you making? School teachers in those made $35 a week. Ouch. And so I got expelled. They kicked me out of school. But the principal was building bleachers for the football team. And he needed a show to raise money for the bleachers. And so I was working at this nightclub across the street from the Oriental Theater and there was Les Brown in his orchestra, and they had a girl singer by the name of Doris Day. She had not made Sentimental Journey yet. They were recording it, but it had not been released. And so I said, Doris, you've got to come to my high school. She said, I high school? Saying, You're high school, are you? And I, I said, yes, I'm in high school, and we're raising money. Would you come and sing a song or two? And she did. She brought her trio with her. 
and we did the show and we raised money. So at 14, you were very worldly wise. Yes, I was making money and living a good life at 14. School is not part of my life, that's for sure. So you're just trying to get out and Ouch. continue to make money. And that's when my father disowned me, yeah. Did he actually disown you? Oh, yeah. He had nothing to do with my uncle, Mike, and the way of life that I was living. So I carried on and made my money and did my thing. How about your mom saying, what happened to my little boy? Well, they moved to Arizona because of health reasons. And I did help drive them to Arizona. They had a trailer and they went to Tucson, Arizona. And we were all living in the trailer, my sister and I and the two of them. Can you imagine four people in a trailer with uh, in the desert of Arizona in 1946? <laughs> it was horrible. So I changed my name to Sion, C-I-O-N-E, Jack Sion. And you stayed in Arizona? No, I went to Hollywood. I had saved a lot of money playing the piano, and I was going to become a movie star. And so when I got there, I stood in line for auditions, and I thought, this is a ridiculous way to make a living. I did one movie, Good News, with June Allison and Peter Lawford. What did you do in the movie? Dan I was a dancer. Yeah, I was a dancer. I didn't want to play the piano anymore. The piano, by the way, uh, kept me out of the service, too. I was with the USO, and um, at the time my draft came up, um, Bob Hope picked our, I had a band called the Jolly Jacks, and he picked the band to go on tour with him. And I said, I'm being drafted, so he got me out of the draft, and uh, I toured with the USO then. And after uh, doing the USO tour, you stayed in Hollywood? I stayed back to Hollywood trying to become a movie star, but it didn't work. But I met I met lots of movie stars there. You sounded like you were a real streetwise young yeah. man. Yeah, I met Eleanor Powell, Dorothy L'Amour. Oh, that was funny with Dorothy L'Amour. Um, they were filming the road show with Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. And of course, I knew Bob Hope from working with them. And, um, and I said, Dorothy, I wrote to you when I was in high school, and you sent me a photograph to Jackie Chuney with all my love, Dolly Lamar. She said, you still have it? I said, yes, I still have it. I used to get dressed up every night and go to Ciro's, Macombo, and uh -huh. Errol Carroll's. Those are the big nightclubs. And sit at the bar thinking I was going to be discovered. I gave that up, um, and the year was 19, 1948. And I moved back. I had no place to go. I spent all my money. I moved back to Phoenix with my mother and father, which was not too happy, but I got a job then at Arthur Murray Dance Studio. Because you could dance. Yeah, because you could dance. And I met my first wife. Who was a dancer, Who student? was a dancer, and we both worked there at Arthur Murray's. We went to New York and worked, thought we were gonna work for Arthur Murray, but the studio in Phoenix blackballed us and the studio in New York said, we don't have an opening right now, but we'll have something later. Why did they blackball you? Because we left the Phoenix studio. Oh, I and see. We were their best dance team they had. And so they thought by blackballing us, we'd come back to Phoenix. So instead, we got a job with the Fred Astaire studio. And I worked for Fred Astaire. And I became, in the daytime, I'd go to audition for Broadway shows. And um, I auditioned for the Arthur Murray show, <laughs> and I became Catherine Murray's dance partner. <laughs> We'd rehearse in the daytime, and I'd teach dancing at Fred Astaire's at night. We left New York because my wife became pregnant and went to Phoenix, and I opened a dance studio. I opened the one studio, and I was doing all the teaching, and pretty soon we had too many students. And my wife was pregnant, having the baby, I had to hire teachers and more teachers and more students, more teachers. And then my sister got involved, and she was just 16 at that time. 
How, she, how old were you? That was 1948. I must have been 19. 19? Yeah. <laughs> I stayed in Phoenix 10 years, and we made all these studios. Guy got a divorce. She got the Tucson studio. I kept the Phoenix, Scottsdale, and all the rest of them. And then I start selling them off to teachers who would run the studio and pay me a percentage of their gross. That's smart. That's ongoing revenue, right? Yes, ongoing revenue. <laughs> and then what happens? I did a first television show. I start producing shows, and then I produced them in nightclubs. I personally appeared at the Westward Ho Hotel in the fancy concert room was equivalent to our monarch room here. And uh, my sister and I became a dance team there. While I was dancing in the uh, concha room, uh, that's where I met my second wife. She came in one night for dinner. I found out that she had a daughter that was eight years old, and my son was with me at that time, and he was seven years old. And I said, um, how about going to the state fair Sunday? Take our kids, wouldn't that be fun? She thought that was our first date. So we took our kids to the fair and from then on it turned into a romance and we got married. We were celebrating our 58th wedding. 58th? Yes. Wow. <laughs> I'm an old man now. <laughs> what, 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 what made her the one? Well, she was such a lady. My first wife was a dancer and it was an entirely different type of personality. Uh, my first wife was in show business, and I was in show business. And you liked the idea of being married to somebody who wasn't in the showbiz right. realm. Right. After Jack Sion got married again, he and his new wife set out on a two-month honeymoon and were going to travel the Orient. About midway through, they decided to make a detour to Honolulu for the rest of their trip. After they arrived here, they both looked for jobs. Well, I couldn't find anything, but she found a job at the Biltmore Hotel. She was secretary to the manager, worked right in. And one night we went to the Forbidden City because we had dinner across the street at the Fisherman's Wharf. On Ala Moana Boulevard, uh, and uh, Forbidden City was... Across the, the street. Right, the, yeah, where war warehouses were. Right. Now. And we were in there, and there were six customers and all these Japanese girls in the show. And so the manager came over and talked to us, a Chinese man, and I said, how can you pay the rent with six people in here? And the show was god-awful show. What kind of show was it? Uh, kabuki dancing, mm -hmm. Japanese. In that period, there was the Oasis, the Gimbashi, the Forbidden City, the Ginza, Leroy's, all Japanese hostesses. There were no Korean hostesses <laughs> then. And they would dance. And so I told him how bad his show was. He said, you want to do a show for me? I said, yeah, I'll do a show for you. I have nothing to do. He said, how much is it going to cost? I said, I'll do a show for you for nothing. I just need something to do. So I did a show at the Forbidden City. And um, I did two shows that made a lot of money. And then I did an ice show. First time we had an ice show in the Forbidden City. I called it Nudes on Ice. So you put in an ice skating rink? Yeah, it was about twice the size of this table, <laughs> portable. And two skater friends of mine from the mainland, I brought them over and said, come and skate a paid vacation, two weeks. So they came over and I had the Japanese girls then, and I used them as show girls, and I talked three of the Japanese girls into going topless. I just had them open their kimonos to add a little more to the show. And what were the skaters wearing? The skaters wore clothes, but the three girls that stood there <laughs> on oh, the ice, they I were see. the nudes on ice. <laughs> that was my hook. Every show needs a hook, you know. Yeah, because you're a marketer, too. Yes. So that so now you're really kind of dealing in a different kind of uh, venue. Right, and there were no nightclubs having any nudity. It was against the law. 
And when did you, you know, you already lied about your age, but now, now you're talking about breaking the law. Well, there were no laws. Uh, Hawaiian dancers worked topless in King Kalakau. Throughout history. <laughs> right. And so what was the law? What was the, what was the big deal? So the next show I did was a complete nude show. I brought burlesque in. It wasn't nude, it was just topless. The girls then had to wear pasties and mm -hmm. silk bras. But it eventually evolved. And every time we would do that, they would come and arrest me. And You're saying this like this is, you know, just part of doing business, but I mean, you, and what was the charge? Was it lewdness, open lewdness? Lewd and lascivious conduct. Well, how did you feel about that? Well, they'd arrest me and I'd say, excuse me, can I go to the restroom? And I'd run in my office and I'd call the TV and the newspaper and I'd stay there until they all got to the So club. you're actually enjoying this. Oh, loving it. And the next morning it was in the papers and it was on TV. Was that part of being a showman? Yes. And business increased. People would see that. Oh, look at arrested, nude. We got to go see that at <laughs> Forbidden City. And how did your new wife think about this? Well, <laughs> she didn't particularly like it, but it was making lots of money. And so we opened that club, then we opened another one. I ended up with 12 bars here. And, and how many arrests? Oh, gosh, I was arrested so many times, but not once conviction. Because, as you said, the laws hadn't caught up with this business activity. Right. We went topless, then we went bottomless, and then we went totally nude. We used to have a uh, businessman's lunch at the dunes. Back when three martinis were tax deductible, right? Right. And it was all businessmen. And... Um, the show was a striptease show. And the secretary said, we're so tired of coming with our boss. Why don't you put a naked man on stage for us? And I just happened to say, well, why don't you get me a reservation for 50 ladies and I'll have a naked man for you. That's how it started. And how many, did you get a reservation for 50? Oh gosh, they called about two weeks later and they said, we have you're 50, you're going to have a naked man? I said, yes. Well, by the time the two weeks came, they had 200 reservations. That filled up my room. <laughs> they kept out my men customers. The ladies took all the seats. And w did you have your naked waiter in no, line? I no, I didn't have how do, you go, how do you hire a naked waiter? In those days, this was now 1973, and there were no such a thing as Chippendales and men strippers. But I had a beach house in Haleiwa that I was renting to five surfers. And they were behind on their rent. So I called them and said, you guys got to pay the rent or you got to come in and do me a favor. They said, what is it? I said, well, you got to come to the dunes Friday and you got to drop your pants on stage. Oh, hell yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> Those women stayed all day. We had the biggest bar business I ever did that afternoon. They all drank, drank, and the surfers were in their Paraded. Paraded without their pants. So when I saw that, I thought, oh, this is a gold mine. So in a week's time, I told the gals, I said, we're going to have waiters every day. Instead of waitresses. Instead of waitresses. Because the women were the ones who were paying more money. Yes, and so. As clients. That's how it happened. I mean, people keep coming back. Oh, Un unreal. 400 lunches Monday through Friday. Besides his steady clientele, Jack Sion's nightclubs attracted attention from many other segments of the Honolulu community, from the liquor commission to church groups to the more unsavory elements of society. Yet for him, it was all just business. Along with the publicity of, wow, look what happened, you gotta go see this, I'm sure there was also this drumbeat uh, from citizens saying, what is this guy doing? It's so vulgar, it's so lewd, it's just horrendous oh, for society. And, and the fact is, you'd come from somewhere else and brought this vulgar stuff to Hawaii, right? Yes. So how, how did you 
justify that? We just continued it. I had the naked waiters in the daytime and the strippers at nighttime and um, soon opened another spot in Waikiki. So it didn't bother you, all the no. criticism? and we'd get arrested and uh, they had no charges. The liquor commission was then in charge and they had vice squad in those days. The vice squad would come in and see it and they'd say, well, what's this? Nothing. But the liquor commission would do all the um, complaining, but they lost every case. So uh, among all of this, I just sense that the, your guiding force is money and showbiz, but you weren't really into the, the flesh stuff of it all? No. Nightclub business is not an easy business, but I stayed the straight line and um, did it as a business. I don't drink. I never did drink. And so I always said, people want to buy me a drink. I said, you know, I'm in the business to sell this. I don't drink it. I raised my children and I have five great-grandchildren, by the way, and um, I've always been a member of the church, even though they fought me tooth and nail, but I thought, can't make donations to the church if you don't let me make money. What did this do to the powers that be in town, the ones who are supposed to make sure that, you know, citizens, you know, aren't bothered by an unsavory element? D did you run into trouble with, um, you, you, obviously the police were, were on your case, but what about politicians? No, no, the politicians agreed that this was something the town needed. Honolulu was ready for this. We have military here, a large population of military. So this is a tourist town. If you saw it in Las Vegas, why wouldn't you see it in Honolulu? And what about as a nexus for organized crime? We had local organized crime in those days. This was the 60s, 70s, and, and by the 80s, I think things were changing. But um, local organized crime w who were getting kickbacks at other places, did they get them from you? Never bothered us, no. The biggest shakedown I thought I had was at the Le Boom Boom Club. The bus drivers that would bring the tour groups into your club, and they would bring 50, 100, 200 a night in those days. And so I had one bus driver said, um, you like the numbers I'm bringing? I said, yeah, it's fine. He says, you know, I can take them to the Al Harrington show. I said, I know that. He said, but for a dollar a head, I'll keep bringing them here. I said, where am I going to get the dollar? He said, out of your register. I said, I can't. It all goes through the books. I can't just go in there and take $100 out because you brought me 100 customers. And, and that didn't work. And besides, the tour companies were charging 25% of the ticket for them. Now they're up to 40%, I hear. That's why there are no shows in Waikiki. Why did you stop doing shows? Because of that. You mentioned that uh, your father disowned you and was just thought you'd be a, be a bum. Did you ever um, get close to him again? Oh, yes. We became very good friends. He worked for me in my dance studios. And then when I had all the nightclubs here, I moved he and my, him, my mother and him over here. And he changed his name to Andy Sion, which made me very proud that he did that, and uh, yeah, we became very close and very good friends. He'd stay up till four o'clock in the morning and work the cashiers and have breakfast with me. In more recent years, you've continued to do shows and your, um, you've had beneficiaries, charitable um, yes, uh, groups have received your- 25 um, years at Pearl Harbor, we did the Mardi Gras Follies, which was a charity fundraiser. Um, I taught tap dancing at the Waikiki Community Center for 10 years. And now I'm at Arcadia, and our show uh, raises money by selling ads in the program, and we have a boutique, and we give that money to Arcadia for the people who need help in staying there. 
they outlive. We have people that are 105 years old. Who've outlived their money. Outlived their money, yes. It takes a lot of money to live in Arcadia. I know there were eyebrows raised when you applied to live in Arcadia because it's a very distinguished place with retired judges, right. retired attorneys. And um, did you, what was that like? What was that application process like for you? Uh, when I first moved in, it was a shock, yes. Um, I wasn't sure that it would last, but it did. And I started the Follies, and we did a little show there using the residents. They all loved it, and the show grew. I'm doing one this year. This is the ninth year. We've lived there now 10 years. No skin showing. No skin showing. Are you still enjoying the shows? Oh, love! I love doing it, yeah. Jack Sion has been out of the nightclub business for over 20 years. At the time of our conversation in 2014, Jack was 87 years old, his trademark chutzpah intact. Mahalo to Jack Sion for sharing his colorful stories with us, and mahalo to you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Ahui ho! For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. I think the general public was ready for nudity. It no longer sells who's interested. You can see it on television. You have videos. The young generation, they're not obsessed with nudity. It's people my age that were raised, and your age, that were raised that it's naughty, don't do that, mustn't do this, and that's what you believed in. I always had the public on my side. And I thought, as long as I have support from the public, then I must be doing something right.